You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not acquit anyone who misuses his name. The third commandment, and I must confess one that uh, has been surprisingly hard to get a handle on. I spent many, many hours reading on this this week, studying, because it's, it's kind of a slippery one. To, to get our minds around what this is getting at, we, we kind of look at this in three parts. First, we've got to figure out, when we say the name of the Lord, what are we talking about? Then we've got to look at, what does it mean to use the name of the Lord? So then we can talk about how it would be misused. Because we got that's the, the commandment, right? Do not misuse the name of the Lord. Well, first, the name of the Lord, uh, God is referred to in many ways in Scripture from the sort of generic Adonai, which means Lord. Um, it, it could have meant like a, 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 a Lord of a land as well, so it's sort of a general term. And then there is El or Elohim, which is sort of a generic word for God. There are specific words like El Shaddai is the God of sustaining, and so there are specific sort of permutations of El. The, that word. But the actual name of God is revealed by God to Moses, and he's having this discussion with the bush, is uh, Yahweh, right? God says, I am the Lord, very general way of saying it. I am the, the, the Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, kind of getting more specific, and finally says, and my name is Yahweh, and that is what it shall always be. This name, uh, Yahweh, the name of God, is what has, has always been found in the context of, of Scripture. When the first time we find people worshiping in the Bible, it's Genesis 4.26. And it doesn't say the people worshipped. What it said was they called upon the name of the Lord. That, so the name of the Lord is always known in worship. When we look at King Solomon, when he finishes his temple and he is praying to dedicate it, he does not pray for this temple for God. He prays for this temple that is for the name of the Lord. And so somehow the name is wrapped up in God being present, God being there wherever God is worshipped. And so if that is God's name, how do we use it? Think about how we use names, right? Think about how your name is used. If, if someone talks, it, it can denotate different uh, relationships. If someone calls me Andy, that's a friend. If you call me Mr. Coon, you must be customer service. If you call me Pastor Coon, you're a church telemarketer. And when they call to sell the church stuff, I usually tell them the pastor is busy, which is true. And then, uh, click. Uh, but, I mean, how your name is used tells something about that relationship, right? And we also use names to claim authority, right? How many times raising kids does this one kid go up and say, one child go up and say, but daddy said I could? Right? What is that? That's a claim of authority. I'm claiming my dad's name for why I can do this. It's the same thing we do when we start writing papers and you have to like cite your sources. What are you doing? You're claiming someone else's name to authorize you to say something that you couldn't say by yourself. And so we use names in various ways, and in the Old Testament it's the same type of thing. We, we see, um, it's in Deuteronomy 6.13, this commandment, The Lord your God you shall fear, him you shall serve, and by his name alone you shall swear. And the way this oath taking, the swearing, uh, what it looks like in the Old Testament is this phrase, as the Lord lives. It's calling God to be sort of the third party to what you're saying. You're saying, you know what, I'm going to do this, and as the Lord lives, it's going to happen. What I just said is going to happen, it's as trustworthy as, as the fact that God is alive. You're calling God into the, the situation. And this happens over 40 times that we know of in the Old Testament. It is a common way when uh, Jonathan swears to protect David and vice versa. This is what they swear by, by the name of the Lord. I've got your back, Jonathan, by the name of the Lord. It's just like God himself is right here who's got your back. Or when Rahab uh, swears to protect the spies uh, that Joshua has sent in to, to spy on the city when they're going to their promised land. As the Lord lives, your life is safe. Now Joshua does warn the people as they're going into the promised land, he warns them not to start making oaths by any other god, because this is a, a concern. If you start making oaths by another god, you will start le being uh, led astray. When the people do go astray, the prophet Jeremiah shows up to tell them, you need to learn again to, live, to swear as the Lord lives. Because if you're not doing that, well, you're going to not be able to trust each other. If as the Lord lives, if you can't trust each other because it, what you say is as certain as God is, then you can't trust what your neighbor says. And what happens to a community when you can't trust what your neighbor's telling you? 
it gets bad. So the first way of using the name of the Lord is to swear oaths by it, to live by it, to say you can trust me because what I'm saying is trustworthy as God himself saying it. As the Lord lives, this is what's going to happen. So that's the first way to use the name of the Lord. The second is in worship. We just read it in the psalm, Psalm 113. It uses uh, praising the name of the Lord three times in, in three verses. We do that in a lot of our hymns. You heard how many times we, we praise the name of the Lord in our hymns. To this day, we still sing that. And, and to use the name of God in worship keeps God from becoming this sort of amorphous, fuzzy, pink cloud of feeling goodness, right? This, it keeps God concrete. Because you're talking about a name, you're talking about a specific person. You're not talking about a vague sense of, yay God. You're talking about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You're talking about the God who first, having brought brought the people out of slavery in Egypt, then took Jesus out of sin and death into, into life. And so this is a very specific God whose name we're, we're, we're swearing by, whose name we're worshiping. And um, there's a final way that we see the name of the God, God being used. It's to bless, right? So we use God's name to swear oaths and to worship. And then the blessing that I'm sure you've heard many times, uh, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. The next verse there is, So shall the priest put my name on the Israelites, and I will bless them. And so the name of God is invoked to bless people. In the name of the Lord, may the Lord bless you and keep you. That's part of worship. That, that's part of, uh, and it's part of worship, the name of the Lord. I think it's, it's, it's given right after the second commandment. The second commandment has said, no idols. So if you can't have idols to hold on to, what do, you, what do you have to hold on to? You have God's name to hold on to. And by it, we, we swear oaths and we, we worship and we bless. And so, if that's the name of the Lord, and, and that's how it is meant to be used, what does it look like to misuse it? The actual literal trend word right there, it's a lusa, and, and it means lift up. Right? You shall not lift up the name of the Lord. It's kind of an interesting word to translate. That's why we get so many variant translations. The King James says to not take the name of the Lord, your God, in vain. What's it mean to take something in vain? I'm not actually certain about that. I don't know. I think the NRSV has a little bit better of a translation when it says uh, misuse. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord. But <clears throat> this lusa, to lift up. What, the way that that verb is used in the Old Testament, if you lift up and you lift up a false report. If you uh, have get, been given authority to report, for example, on how a battle is going and you go and tell the general that you're winning when you're really getting your butt whooped. And so you lift up a false report and you're using your, the authority given to you, uh, that's to, to lift up. That's using your authority falsely. That's the same um, type of, of, of thing that we see in, in Ecclesiastes. This, this term, Lusa, shows up with uh, that vanity of vanities, you know, the refrain of Ecclesiastes. Vanity of vanities, there's nothing new under the sun. Vanity of vanities, it's all just sort of fluff, it's meaningless. And, and that's the same term for Lusa that shows up. Jeremiah talks about when my people have forgotten me, they burn offerings to a delusion. That's that same word, delusion, to lift up delusional uh, things that just aren't true. To, so to use the name of God to swear as the Lord lives and either tell a lie or as the Lord, Lord lives and to sit, talk about stuff that's just meaningless, that's just fluff. And, and the delusion here to say that they are led down the wrong paths, uh, later Amos talks about it's in Amos 2. When father and son go into the same woman, they profane the name of God. Right? When people have, have lost the, tr the, the, the grounding in the name of God, the God who calls them to holiness, that God who calls them to a certain way of life, they start to stray from that. And they lusa, they lift up uh, what is not actually true, and they start doing things that are wrong and despicable. And so, this third commandment, it lays out, you use the name of God to make oaths, to use in worship, to bless. You don't, mit, to misuse the name of God would be to use God's name to condone lies, to say, thus saith the Lord, when it really isn't the case, or to lead people on, to sound good, to put on airs, to say things that aren't, the, that aren't worth the paper it's written on, you might say. 
And so there are three temptations to break the third commandment we're going to look at. One is obvious, two are a little bit more subtle. The obvious temptation is the classic way that we see the third commandment broken. We tell God who to damn. Right? Put those two words next to each other, you know what I'm talking about. It's the one word that still bothers me. I just, I, ugh, it bothers me to hear that said. And the problem with telling God who to damn is you're playing the role of God and you're trying to tell God who to judge. And that's a little bit presumptuous, isn't it? Right? It doesn't really work. It's not our role to judge and to tell God who to damn and who to save. That's just not our gig. And so if you can tell me this week you're not going to start damning people on behalf of God, congratulations, you are not breaking the third commandment, at least the, the obvious way to break it. As for all the other words that we regard as swear words in our culture, you know what the Bible has to say about them? Nothing. There's nothing in the Bible about what we, what we think about as swearing. The idea of certain words being swear words is a fairly modern invention. In the ancient times, there weren't swear words. They're just So the Bible doesn't actually say anything or really care, it seems. Our modern culture does, but eh. Um, which is good news to me, because as many of you know, it, up until Jesus and I had a discussion when I was 20, I, I kind of swore like a sailor, and um, I try not to now. Um, please don't judge me too harshly if you're right there when I cut myself. But, uh, you know, it's just not something this really addresses, though. It's just not really there. Now, the two subtle temptations of the ways to break the third commandment, they're, they're at the two extremes. One is to start using the Ten Commandments and to lose track of who gave them to us. If you start putting the Ten Commandments up in places where they aren't gathered in the name of the Lord your God who brought you out of slavery and out of Egypt, remember the first, first part of the Ten Commandments, before God says what to do, God says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of slavery, out of Egypt. And if, you start losing tra if we start losing track of that, then we've missed the point. It's to take the Ten Commandments and to make them so, some sort of generalized ethical principle is to forget the name of the God who gave them to us. And that's to break the third commandment. Right? We can't put the Ten Commandments up unless they are posted in a place where we are gathered in the name of the God who brought us out of Egypt, who first having brought he the Hebrew people out of Egypt, then brought Jesus out of death. <clears throat> And so we post the Ten Commandments where we are gathered in the name of the God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. To strip off that first sentence is to misuse the name of God in that we are not putting God's name where it should be, right there at the, the top of the Ten Commandments. The second subtle temptation is that the other extreme is to start tossing around God's name to authorize things that God does not authorize. Right? To say that God says this, and when, no, that really isn't what, what, it, what God has said. There are, the old way of doing that was, uh, in the Old Testament, they would say, thus saith the Lord, or, or uh, as the Lord lives. They'd use the name of, the God that way, name of God that way. We don't tend to do that today with that phrase. Um, you ever hear anyone start tar talking about how, you know, the, just the Bible says, the Bible says this, or the Bible says that, and you, you ever find yourself thinking... I'm not sure if that's really what the Bible says. When people start tossing around that phrase, you know, the Bible says, and then they start saying things that, you know, that's not actually all that clear. That's breaking the third commandment. That's using the name of God to back up or to say something that God has not spoken about. For example, how many times have you heard a sermon that has mentioned or referenced or talked about how, how Christians should not smoke or dance or drink? Right? Anyone, you've heard those sermons before in your lives? The Bible has nothing to say about that. Jesus made a whole lot of wine for his first miracle. J David danced his way all the way through the holy city of Jerusalem, and it, smoking is never mentioned in the Bible. Right? To say that Christians should not smoke or dance or drink is to break the third commandment, because you're claiming the authority of God, the name of God, for something that just isn't there. Right? Now, drinking, smoking, and, and dancing may or may not be a good idea. You never want to see me dance. That's a horrible idea. Uh, but it, 
to say something you can't assume that God agrees with you just because it's your opinion. I can't think that myself. The people who are worst about this are politicians and pastors, right? That, that, to get up front, I get up front every Sunday and I, I, and I thus saith the Lord and then I talk for 15 to 20 minutes and I, this is a danger for me because I, I, I say things and, and as my wife can attest, I tend to say things with more certainty than I some, sometimes intend. It gets us in trouble. It gets me in trouble at least. And, and so this is a danger. We start saying things we think that because I, I'm a good Christian, this is why I think this must be God's opinion. Eh, not so much. There are things that are black and white, but there are far more, far more many things that are gray that, you know, we just don't know. Now, there's a word for people who take uh, the word, name, of the, name of God, the name of the Lord, and use it to back up their opinions when it really isn't God's opinion. Ezekiel tells us what this name is. The name is false prophets. Right? Isn't that a nice strong word? Call someone a false prophet. The word of the Lord, this is Ezekiel 13. The word of the Lord came to me. Prophecy against the prophets of Israel who are prophesying. Say to those who prophesy out of their own imagination, hear the word of the Lord. They're imagining things and saying it's God's word. Thus says the Lord God, alas for the senseless prophets who follow their own spirit and have seen nothing. Your prophets have been like jackals among the ruins. You have not gone up into the breaches or repaired a wall for the house of Israel so that you might stand in battle on the day of the Lord so they haven't even helped by going and rebuilding the city. Instead they are prophesying their own opinion in the name of God. Says the Lord, when the Lord has not sent them and yet they wait for the fulfillment of their word. Have you not seen a false vision or uttered a lying divination when you have said, says the Lord, even though I did not speak? Therefore, thus says the Lord God, because you have uttered falsehood and envisioned lies, I am against you, says the Lord God. My hand will be against the prophets who see false visions and utter lying divinations. They shall not be in the council of my people, nor be enrolled in the register of the house of Israel, nor shall they enter the land of Israel, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God, because in truth they have misled my people, saying, Peace, when there is no peace. It's about as stark as the Bible gets talking about people. People are saying, uh, thus said the name, using the name of God to back up their own imaginations, they will be stripped of their status in the house of Israel. They will not be part of the people. They're cast out. Whew. Right? The, the last part of this verse, this third commandment, is... Uh, when you, uh, those who do this, God shall not acquit. Right? If you use the name of the Lord your God in vain, God shall not acquit. There's one other place where uh, in the Bible it talks about the sin that shall not be acquitted, that shall not be forgiven. And that's where Jesus says, what, what's the one unforgivable sin? Blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, right? You blaspheme the Holy Spirit, sin against the Holy Spirit. And I think there's a connection there. I'm not certain. But I think there is a connection there because when you are attempting to speak and, and take authority, to take God's authority to say, because I say it, this must be God's opinion. If you're doing that, you're, you, you, it's impossible to ask for forgiveness because you can't see yourself as wrong because you're assuming that because you said it, it's God's opinion, right? And so God cannot forgive if we aren't willing to ask for forgiveness. And, and if we are speaking the name of God and being a false prophet, we are sinning against the Holy Spirit because we're taking on the Spirit's role and, and trying to, and saying, God will not inspire us. I have enough inspiration myself. Thank you very much. The third commandment, it's surprisingly more complicated than I expected. It lays out, uh, it's use the name of God to swear by oaths to worship, to bless, but not to uh, use the name of God to tell God who to judge and how. And furthermore, not to forget the name of God, strip it off the Ten Commandments and start posting it wherever we please outside of the context of worship where we gather in the name of the God who brought the Hebrew people out of slavery. And finally, the, I think the real temptation is to speak with the surety of God when there isn't any. To speak and say, thus saith the Lord. This is what the Bible says. That this is, obviously, if you're Christian, you have to believe this when, uh, really, there isn't that type of certainty. There are many things we can be certain of. Jesus loves us. Creation is good. The cross is for the forgiveness of sins. But much beyond the, the centralities of our faith, whew, start speaking with certainty, and that third commandment gets really close. Let's try to avoid that.